interrupt your lunch, please keep eating. Hopefully, again, we won't give you indigestion. Uh, but we have uh, some very esteemed folks uh, for you to hear from today and the persons of Rachel and Jeff. And let me start with Rachel. Um, so I feel like much of my professional career is introducing Rachel. <laughs> um, Rachel is a sort of unsung hero of the FBI's uh, work on elder fraud. Uh, she's traveled the world not only to work with our uh, agents in the field who call her for information every single day, but she also works with foreign law enforcement on all these different sorts of matters. We've traveled to far flung places like Delhi, India, Accra, Ghana, Togo to work with foreign law enforcement. You know, you all hear about romance fraud. Raise it a little higher. Okay, is that any better? Okay. <clears throat> so hear about the romance scams, oftentimes coming from West Africa. We've been to West Africa to try and work with law enforcement on the ground there. Uh, tech support fraud, government imposter fraud. <clears throat> We've been to India to work with law enforcement there. We are getting a lot of, uh, we're gaining ground. A lot of foreign law enforcement are interested in working with U.S. law enforcement. So it just increases the stakes in getting those complaints into IC3 and getting the complaints into Consumer Sentinel. Uh, but again, you're gonna hear a lot about the expertise that the FBI has. So much of this is a repository right in this brain right here. So she has a lot of information. If you have questions, she's a wealth of information. So please, um, Rachel. The uh, yeah. Testing, testing. All right. I was not about to ask Jeff to give up his body mic. He's attached to it now. Um, so as Rich said, I don't even know what to say now because I've that that almost made me cry. Uh, Rich and I have worked together for a very long time on this, and I've been with the IC3 for 13 years, and this elder fraud is one of the things that I am most passionate about because we all have these people in our lives that we know are getting scammed. People we know personally, I have friends that come up to me and say, hey, I know you work on this. So can you know, I tell you about this. I'm like, you can tell me about it, but please go file a report because I can't do anything about it. Can you hear me? Closer. All right. So, like I said, we all have people that we know in our everyday lives that are getting scammed by this stuff. Um, let me see if this will work. These are last year's stats. Like I said over there, we are working on our 2023 report. We are hoping that our annual report will be out in the beginning of March. A couple weeks later after that, we're hoping our elder fraud report will be out. And then a couple weeks after that, we're also aiming to produce a crypto report. And that will just be about the different types of scams and how crypto is affecting those scams. And it's really, yes, it's just a new payment mechanism and what they're using now. But it's growing and we want people to know about it and how they can be prepared. Um, you can see here through the charts how much the losses for our over 60 community has just increased through the years. And I'm gonna try to move quick because he said he needs a lot of time. So um, here's how crypto has affected our over 60 population in the last few years. You can just see last year was exponentially increased. This year, it's even more than that. Um, I can't give away 23 numbers yet, but everything has gone up. Our losses at least 40% increased from last year. This is one of my main focuses at the IC3 is our call center fraud. Chad is your tech support, your customer support. Um, I know FTC calls it, um, what do you call like bank imposters? And um, like we lump everything just basically business imposters, thank you. We kind of lump everything into tech support, uh, customer support. It's the same subjects. Generally, it's the same people committing the same types of scams, just a different angle, they find what works. Um, 
different trends we're seeing lately. If you take out your phone, phone right now and you Google phantom hacker, that is a PSA that we published in October. Um, huge uptick in that was what we're seeing. Um, it's been picked up by multiple media outlets. Um, I would encourage you to read up on that just in case somebody would come to you and say, first of all, it starts out as a tech support scam. Then they pass this victim off to somebody who's impersonating law enforcement. And then they pass them off to somebody who's impersonating their bank. They're all working together to help liquidate these victims funds. Mostly, I call it the retirement record. It's your older people who have saved their entire lives. All their investments, everything they've saved is gone. And it's millions and millions of dollars. Um, another trend we're seeing lately is the use of their convincing victims to cash out their money and to buy gold, silver, um, or just send cash. They're convincing people to meet couriers in person or sending these couriers to their homes to pick up the gold or to pick up the cash. Um, we also seeing a big use of crypto ATMs. Take the cash out, go feed it into a Bitcoin machine. Um, we're getting better at tracing some of this and faster at looking at some of these complaints where if they are providing, and especially with law enforcement, if you're with this victim and they have a crypto address, put it in that complaint because there's so much we can find out about who was doing this and where this money is going if we actually have that crypto hash, if we have that address. Um, I know victims themselves don't quite understand. We are updating our complaint form to hopefully ask for that information and encourage them. You know, this is what you're looking for when we want a hash. This is what we're looking for when we when we want an address. Um, but that type of information is so important. One thing I will tell you when somebody files with IC3, they will not hear from us. Uh, we get probably 2,500 complaints a day. There are 30 of us. And that's everybody, IT staff, management, everybody. So they will not hear from us. Um, we are focused on taking those reports that come into us and getting these victims hooked up with active cases or getting these aggregated to send out for referrals for new cases. We, uh, we are working with our field offices. We're working with state and locals. We don't just work with FBI either. We have DHS cases, postal, secret service, sec um, we have a remote query portal where sworn law enforcement can access our data. We keep track of everybody that comes into our, you know, and downloads our data and searches it every day. Um, on my other presentation that I didn't get to show, uh, I did actually give a chart that shows how much data is um, downloaded by sworn law enforcement from our database, hundreds of thousands of records every year. So just because maybe the FBI is not investigating it does not mean that somebody else Secret Service, DHS is not looking into it. The most important part is getting that information into IC3 so that somebody can search it. Okay, sorry, back to call center fraud. Um, so realizing what a problem this was, it was at one point, maybe a couple years ago, where tech support and government impersonation were the biggest losses to, for our elderly community. Just, you know, they didn't understand, or if somebody says they're with law enforcement, they trust them. So they do what they say. Um, so th at that point in time, DOJ, we started this initiative. We actually have um, most of these scams emanating out of India. They are starting to branch out a little bit, but most of them are still from that general area. DOJ has helped fund an ALAT position in our league at in New Delhi, who is specifically working with law enforcement in India for these problems. Um, FBI, we do have noticed some other agencies are funneling information or case information that way. The league at's working with the locals, they're helping to do raids and break, take down some of these call centers. Conversely, the locals there are also doing these raids they're gathering what information they can and sending it back to us and we're helping them formulate their prosecution. We're helping them find victims that are related to these call centers they raid. Uh, the field is helping them do victim interviews. They're also helping um, to put together when, when the actual trial is going on, you know, helping the victims do virtual interviews during the legal uh, trial process. So, um, and I have to give a lot of credit to our Washington field office because they have actually stepped up and they are basically overseeing this whole process with the league at and with DOJ. Um, 
this really took off, you know, in like the fall of 2022 through 2023. Um, just the, the stats that I have there available were that we had 26 arrests in India through 13 joint operations with the locals there. Now, and I realize it is whack-a-mole, but it also brings it to the forefront there because they're also published every time there's a raid, there's a news article that comes out. Um, I have a Google alert set up to notify me anytime a news article gets published anywhere about a call center raid in India. I'm getting pinged every day. So, and they're not always about tech support or government impersonation or whatever, different kinds of scams, but I'm reading something almost every day about a raid that's occurring somewhere. So that is getting into the public eye over there. People are realizing it's scams. We do get reports even at IC3 from people who say, I was employed there. I didn't realize it was a scam and I wanna come forward and tell you what I know. So that has been really helpful. That's things we can pass along to the league at. They can pass it to the locals and hopefully bust those up. Did I forget anything about that? Okay. So, um, crypto confidence investment fraud, and it is commonly known as pig butchering, which the Bureau does not like the term pig butchering. I didn't create it. It was out there in the world before, you know, we started picking up on it, but that's what it's commonly called pig butchering. Um, and yeah, <laughs> so I really don't need to give an explanation on crypto investment scams. Um, you know, you're meeting somebody online in a dating app, app website. It's even now evolving into, I got a job online and they wanted me to invest in this. Um, it's not just romance related anymore. It can be just friends. It's people getting meeting on popular professional sites. I want to, I don't want to say LinkedIn, but you know, um, but that's one, I mean, it, it's really any dating websites, you know, that where you can meet somebody, it's these professional sites where you meet people and just, you make build relationships. It's that trust factor that they, that they hone in on. Um, but that is actually in the last two years has overtaken all losses over everything, um, billions of dollars that are reported to us every year in that, yes. So, yes. And if you can see there, you can see the legats are all, you know, from that general area. Um, they're using AI a lot to generate their conversations um, because it can be done quickly. It sounds normal conversation. Um, they're using it to generate fictitious identities, to generate conversations. So it just sounds like a regular person that you're talking to. So, um, if you ever get a chance, there are some one wonderful, interesting articles about pig butchering out there. Um, just go out and Google. There was a particular company, uh, Vice did one talking about some of these, um, these, uh, call centers that do this, um, basically they are human trafficking. People go there thinking they're getting a real job and they are held captive. They are not allowed to leave. Um, it's very sad what happens to the people that go into these call centers thinking they're getting a legit job. So it's not just, you know, an elder fraud or a fraud issue. It's a human rights issue. It's, it's sad. Um, but I would encourage you to read up on some of the things that are happening with this. So. In this response, there, there is actually a team formulating that would hopefully work somewhat like the one that does in India. Um, the Bureau knows it's a problem. They're working on it. Um, if you remember, I mentioned over there, we talked about the, um, the virtual asset unit. Um, the Bureau is formulating a response on how to handle this fraud. We do realize that it's going to be difficult because of where the call centers are located. However, getting the reporting in we're finding ways to stop the bleeding a little bit slow the losses um, but getting those reports into ic3 are important because they are using that data in those efforts um, and like i said when you're reporting things making sure you have 
crypto addresses in there, crypto wallets, that's really important. That data is being pulled out and being used. Um, Um, your traditional romance scams, and if you, when you look at IC3 data, like when our report comes out, we actually do not include the crypto confidence investment frauds in the confidence romance category. Yes, they often start out as a romantic relationship that leads into a fake investment, but we classify all that in our investment category because that is where the true loss is taken. Um, in the investment, the fake investment, when you look at our numbers and you look at confidence romance, that is truly romance scams. It also includes your uh, grandparent scams. And one of the things I'll note with our grandparent scams, the in-person pickups have been noted increasingly, um, and they're targeting other family members. It's no longer just grandparents. They're going to aunts, uncles, um, younger people who you wouldn't consider that would fall to these as easily, but it's happening. So it's not just grandparents anymore, but it will still be termed the grandparent scam. So. Um, and in that, with romance scams, you know, a lot of that comes out of, I have that slide in here or not? No. Okay, so with the romance scams, a lot of that stuff is coming out of your West African you know, area. That is another project that we have started with DOJ. We do have an ALAT down there who is working with the, the West African related fraud. And there is, uh, the FBI Cleveland office has volunteered to kind of head that up on the Bureau's behalf. And they are working cases that are for subjects that are actually in West Africa doing your romance scams and those types of things that generally come out of that area. I will note, just so you know, that we're finding too with pig butchering, that's starting to come out of Africa also. They see it works, so they're gonna do it too. So, that's right. <laughs> that's right. I mean, if it works, they're gonna do it. Um, that's why I would not be surprised to see it spread to other parts of the, the world. Even like with your tech support government impersonation, we see it in other places, still generally in India, but there are call centers springing up all over. And we are seeing a lot of change. You know, we're seeing a lot of different differences being made by people like Rachel and the teams that are working on these. And one example is um, there was a, about a year and a half ago or something, there was a, a suicide by an older gentleman um, in a tech support fraud scheme. And within about a year, Indian law enforcement arrested the person who was responsible for the scam. So um, having these groups that go from grassroots, local law enforcement, state law enforcement, and then connected with FBI, connected with DOJ, connected with the ALAT on the ground in these other countries, connected to law enforcement in those countries. All of that is necessary if we're going to conduct actions like that to respond. And the response has to be immediate, right? That it took a year, but that's a very short period of time from knowing that something like a suicide took place to somebody being arrested in India. We want to cut down on that as much as possible, but that is huge progress. If this was, you know, we've been working on these issues for a decade now or more, and we did not have cooperation from foreign law enforcement, especially in, in some of uh, these other countries. But now, because of FBI's commitment to on the ground work, that kind of action is possible. So I think you all coming into the mix are a crucial piece so that it can be from the grassroots to the grassroots in these other countries. And I want to add, because it's not just FBI, because we have, I want to, there was a case out of Houston that involved FBI agents, Secret Service, DHS, and it all centered around the money mules that were collecting money for these types of scams. Um, but it was a huge effort. They were able to arrest a lot of people in this. Um, but like I said, it takes everybody working together. Um, one thing about that, the, the suicide that Rich had mentioned, um, 
not only, you know, because of the work that was done on that case, you know, they were able to get recordings and things of, you know, the call center talking with this victim, you know, they're not only going to be charged with, you know, the tech support angle of it, they're going to be charged probably also with this person's death. Um, another league at where the money was actually wired to and went through Peru. Um, they said, you know, if we can possibly trace that, maybe we can charge who that money mule is too. So it's not, you know, getting it out there and getting it, it making it more known that people are paying attention and that people are getting charged is important. So. Bill Police Department, Special Investigations Unit, and a member of the Secret Service Financial Crime Task Force. Heard a little bit from Jeff a little bit earlier, um, but he has a lot to describe in terms of his activities. And so take it away, Jeff. Thank you, sir. <clears throat> uh, like you said, uh, my name is Detective Jeff Prater. I'm a detective, okay? I'm not a federal agent. Um, I'm on the I'm on the ground level. We're, we're the we're the ones with the boots are on the ground. Okay. Um, very quickly, um, our department noticed that this financial crime is going to be a, is going to be a big problem. Um, so they embedded me into the Secret Service Task Force. Now, one of the things that's really nice about the Secret Service Task Force versus other task forces out there is that we're a small agency. My agency is only 50 sworn personnel, and that's counting our admin. That's it. Nine of those 50 are school resource officers. Okay, so we're a small agency, but I'm embedded into the Secret Service as a task force officer, and I'm only there part-time. Okay, most task forces require full-time. That means your agency has to give somebody up for a whole year. But as a part-time task force, I go over there when I have extra time to work on stuff, and I work over there. <clears throat> and then when I, if I need to focus on stuff at the PD, I focus on stuff at the PD. We're all, all our law enforcement agencies are suffering right now with staffing. Okay, so guess what? There was about two or three months I didn't go to the Secret Service office. I had to, we had to work on what was my number one priority, which was my crimes in Colleyville. <clears throat> but being a member of the task force has really opened up a lot of opportunities for us. Um, just like most federal law enforcement agencies, majority of their cases are not started by the feds. They're started by a local law enforcement agency that makes a traffic stop or gets into something, and next thing you know, they're going down the rabbit hole or they're pulling on strings, and this thing starts blossoming. And then at that point, that's when we're able to reach out to our federal partners, because if it's going on in your community, I promise you that exact same crime is going on somewhere else in the United States and in multiple jurisdictions. So one of the things that we do, I can figure out how to operate this thing. Okay, here we go. Um, I would say, here's just some kind of key points that you wanna focus on. Um, if you're a small agency, reach out to your local task force. Um, not every Secret Service office has a task force, but we're always willing to help. Um, if, even if you're not in the Dallas-Fort Worth area, um, maybe you're in Oklahoma City, but if we can assist you, we can assist you. Um, we have a electronics lab, which is one of the best in the nation. Um, yes, we can crack into bad guy cell phones. <clears throat> we can get the, We don't have to have their password. Sometimes we can crack that code and get into it once you have your warrant, and we'll do that for you. Our lab will do that for free. If you're, an, if we have Oklahoma City will send stuff to us for um, our lab or our lab guys to crack into it. Child pornography, cell phones, Celebrite, um, Gray Key. We have all that stuff. Stuff that local law enforcement don't have the money to spend. Gray Key's eighty thousand dollars a year per person. We don't have that kind of budget, but reach out to your federal partners. They have that. There's a lot of resources out there that you all you got to do is just ask. <clears throat> um, networking. Networking is one of the most important things that you can do in this in this job. 
I tell everybody I am not that smart, but I guarantee you I know somebody who is, and I know someone who knows something about this, and I will reach out to them. Um, business cards. I will grab every business card I can get my hand on, and I will put, take that back and put that in an Excel document. Um, just since I've been here, I've gotten about four phone calls and text messages. Hey, do you know someone here? Do you know someone here? And I'll network. Hey, yes, I do know. I don't know someone, but I know someone I can put you in contact with, and that person can help you out. Networking is very important. One of the things that I learned from the Tarrant County District Attorney's Office, um, we are very blessed in Tarrant County. We have a dedicated uh, district attorney's office that has a unit that's their only job is elder crime, whether it be physical <coughs> abuse, abuse inside of a nursing home, or it be financial. That's their only job. They have a dedicated, they have two dedicated prosecutors. That's all they do. And they have two uh, investigators and they have a financial analyst. This is another resource that I can network and go to. But one of the things that I learned from um, the chief prosecutor there and her lead investigator is attach a photo of your victim to your case. Okay, when we go through the police academy, we're caught. This, don't make this personal. Don't make this personal. I think that's a big mistake. You need to remember that your victim is a human being. That is a real, live human being. Attach a photo to your victim to your case, and that will remind you this is a real person. Okay? Um, get to know your victims. Talk to your victims. Um, I've had my victims who have passed away before the trial. I've had my victims commit suicide because they've lost everything. Guys, you have to make this personal. Okay, you have to. You have to make this a human being. Um, if you know your victim and you've interviewed your victim, body cams are wonderful. If you're not using body cams, please at least use a digital recorder to record your conversation. I have been able to testify on stand even though my victim has passed away because I heard it directly from the victim. And that's your, your testimony can be very, very powerful. Um, the biggest, I think one of the biggest things is think outside of the box. Um, my background came from narcotics, um, working drug interdiction, working undercover. Um, when I actually took my uh, psych and my polygraph, one of the questions they were asking me is, um, have you ever been in possession of illegal drugs? Yes. Have you ever sold illegal drugs? Yes. Have you ever purchased illegal drugs? Yes. At that time, the guy, the, the uh, polygraph examiner stopped it, stopped it. He said, you do realize you're applying for a police job? I'm like, well, yes, sir, but I worked undercover. So it's an undercover position. I bought drugs and I sold drugs. So the, I'm answering the question truthfully. If you'll reword it, like, have you ever done this in an unofficial capacity? No, I've never had never. Well, then it, it, he was like, I never thought about it that way. But you have to think about these investigations outside of the box because in narcotics, what are they focused on? They're focused on the money. That's all they care about. And on elder fraud, all they care about is the money. So you think like they do. Do what they do. And you'll, you'll learn so much about them. Um, resources. We talked a little bit about resources. Um, Secret Service, um, we have our squad. I know the FBI has an elder uh, financial crimes task force. A buddy of mine is on it in San Diego. Um, I cannot tell you how many times I'm working a case and I reach out to him and he is working the exact same case. And now we're linking up together. Um, reach out to your task forces. They're an incredible resourcing. Staffing, they can help give you people. They have the electronic uh, crime labs that they can help you out with that. <laughs> Who does not have a Walmart in their store or in their community? Everybody has a Walmart. One of the best resources I have found is Walmart Global Investigations. They are incredibly law enforcement friendly. They don't need a subpoena. They don't need a court order. They have a little one-page form that you fill out, and they will provide you with everything. They And trust me, bad guys go to Walmart. Okay, They're going to go to Walmart. 
They can pull video for you. They can pull the receipts. They can check, hey, yeah, this is where he's been buying stuff at. I had actually looking for one of my bad guys. I had his credit card number. They pulled, they ran his credit card number. But hey, yeah, yesterday he bought socks and some undershirts in San Diego, California. How did he get to San Diego? I'm looking for him in Texas. So we were able to quickly find him. So Walmart is a wonderful, wonderful resource. They are actually on our Secret Service team. Um, we are one of the few task forces that have corporate businesses embedded into our task force. We have Walmart, we have Target, we have AT&T. We're actually bringing on a couple of banks now. But this, we're all fighting the same problem. Why not bring our resources together, right? Um, your local district attorney's office, they can help you out. A lot of local DAs have financial analysts that they will, they will do a lot of the, the number crunching for you. Take advantage of this, use this. Um, FedEx and UPS, wonderful resources, guys. Um, we were running for probably about three months. Every other day, I was getting a phone call from a FedEx location. Hey, we've got another package and it's full of cash. We got another package, it's full of cash. Run down there, intercept the package. Um, what we mainly did is we would seize the package, we would then get that money back to the victim. Okay, the biggest thing in financial crimes against elderly is remember, yes, we all want to put a bad guy in jail, okay, but that's not going to happen most of the time. But if I can get money back to my victim, that's a win. That is a huge win. I may not get all the money back, but if I can get some of that money back, that's a huge win. And I cannot tell you how much cash we were getting out of FedEx boxes and UPS boxes. And all it took was me going to the FedEx store, talking to the FedEx employees, saying, hey, if you have an elderly person who comes in here, they seem a little confused on how to ship out an $80 next day air envelope. Folks, elderly people don't have $80 to spend. They're living on a fixed income to send a next day air envelope that has to be there before 10 o'clock in the morning. Or they could send that same envelope for maybe $40 and it gets there in the afternoon. These are just little bitty things that you can pick up and that you can talk to them. I'm gonna show you some photos of some really uh, some neat packages that we actually intercepted. Um, church groups and senior centers, go out and talk to these people, okay? Take an hour out of your day and go and talk to these people. You would be really surprised. Um, almost every time I have done this, almost 100% of the people that have were attendance there either were a victim of a fraud scam or they knew someone who was a victim of a fraud scam. And folks, not a single one of them have reported it. Okay, so if they're not reporting it, Rachel and her team can't do their job because we're missing important numbers. And it's all about the numbers. The numbers don't lie. So we have to take advantage of those numbers and use them. <clears throat> um, in Texas, we have what's called the Texas Financial Crime Intelligence Center. Um, they are based in Tyler, Texas. They are funded by the state of Texas and they do nothing but financial crime intelligence. Um, they have law enforcement, they have analysts, uh, and then, then they have techn technical support. Um, they can do cell phone dumps, they can do computer dumps. Um, they, they're very, very helpful. And if you're Texas law enforcement, it's free. Doesn't, they don't charge you a dime for it. They'll even send out people to help you. Um, I'm pretty sure that if you are outside the state of Texas and your state doesn't have it, if you call down there and you talk to uh, Captain Roberts, I'm pretty sure he'll help you out. Um, you'd be surprised because if you're having the problem in your state, we're having it in our problem in our state too. The same problem is going on. I promise you. Um, U.S. Postal Inspectors. We actually have a postal inspector embedded into our task force. Um, bad guy's got to get mail. I mean, he does. He's going to get mail. Postal, you'd be surprised. Postal inspectors can find people, okay? They can help you find where your bad guy's putting his head down at night. <clears throat> and they're a great resource. Adult Protective Services. Um, 
that is probably the most overworked people in the world. They are drowning. Um, and there's no relief for them. They, they are, I mean, these poor, these poor men and women who do that job are working hard. And they very rarely get to work with law enforcement in a positive note. So if you have an elderly person who's been taken advantage of, reach out to them because they can supply you with a lot of services that I never even knew about. And not only that, but they can help me out with my case. And any time where you possibly have a suspect identified and they're taking advantage of elderly people, these people will bend over backwards to help you because they so rarely do they hear something positive and they're willing to do everything they can to help you out. Um, take advantage of them. Crypto company currencies. Um, you want to make a cop run from an investigation? Financial crime and cryptocurrency. And they will panic. You can have an active shooter in a building, and by gosh, we're the first ones in there. <clears throat> no problem. But you talk about money and, and cryptocurrency, we're terrified to death of it. Um, don't be. We have successfully seized cryptocurrency on the state level. I've frozen crypto wallets and seized the wallet and got the money back to my victim. It can be done on a, and this is from a city level, not acting as a secret service, acting as a city level. Um, any of my law enforcement people out here, if you need a go-by for a seizure warrant, I have a go-by for a seizure warrant. We did the first one ever in Tarrant County. If you need a go-by for a biometric cell phone search warrant, we did the first ones in North Texas. And I've used it seven or eight times now. I will be happy to give you mine. There's no reason to reinvent the wheel. Send me an email. I'll, I'll be happy to share anything I have. Um, you know where I got mine? From a very good friend of mine who's with the FBI in New York. And that's all he does. And he is a West African guru. And I reached out to him. I said, Will, I said, I got the weirdest question for you. Have you ever done a biometric cell phone search warrant? He's like, well, Jeff, it's March. Um, I've done 12 so far this year. And I'm like, oh, you're my new best friend. And I said, can, I, can, I, can you help me? He's like, I'll mail it to you. He emailed it to me. He said, and what did he do? He highlighted. He said, everything I highlighted, you need to change it. Okay? So guess what? When I send you mine, it's going to be highlighted. You need to change that. Make it to fit you. Um, but networking and knowing people, because I promise you, none of us know how to do this by ourselves. We have to work together. Um, Coinbase, very, very law enforcement friendly. Okay? Um, we actually have a Coinbase account that is strictly for victim compensation. So when I seize cryptocurrency, that money goes into our crypto wallet for our police department. It's not an undercover one. It clearly says the Colleyville Police Department. And that money is, when we seize that money, that money, then we get it back to our victim. Now, the big thing about cryptocurrency, what I would highly encourage you if you're going to seize cryptocurrency, and I would recommend you do it, do not put in your court order that you're going to exchange the cryptocurrency for U.S. dollars. Okay? Cryptocurrency fluctuates every couple of seconds. Okay, so what we do on ours is that I am seizing X number, X dollar, or X Bitcoin, whatever, not US dollar version, whatever that cryptocurrency is. Okay, that's what I seized. And that is exactly what I am giving back to my victim. Okay, and the victim has to go get a crypto wallet, and we will give, we will transfer that into their wallet. And if it's a Coinbase, but that's who we use. They do not charge law enforcement a fee, okay? That's a big help for us. And so I give that money right back to the victim. Then the victim is responsible to change the cryptocurrency into cash, okay? Because I don't want to be in charge of that because it could go up and it could go down. Um, so if you're going to do cryptocurrency, that's the way I would do it. CoinMe. CoinMe is the nation's largest crypto ATM company, okay? Who owns CoinMe? Coinstar. Coinstar owns it. That's the machines you take your bucket full of change and you dump it in at the grocery store and it counts it and they charge you a fee. 
that's who owns CoinMe. Incredibly law enforcement friendly. They will, they will help you out with no problem at all. Um, I can send them a subpoena, and within usually 48 hours, they're sending it right back to me. Um, they're very quick on their response. They will also take a law enforcement freeze letter. Has anybody ever done a freeze letter to freeze a bank account? <clears throat> okay, if you have not done that, get with your district attorney. Okay, make sure they are good with that. I freeze bank accounts and crypto accounts. I mean, I, I'll have you a letter in five minutes. Boom, I send them a letter. And it locks that account. Um, consider it kind of like a, um, a dam, okay? Dam's built. Water can't get past the dam. The money can't get past the dam. But guess what? More money can come in. I froze a bank account that was on a BEC, and there was about $200,000 in there, which was not bad. I froze it on Thursday evening. Saturday morning, uh, one of the vice presidents at the bank um, that I'm good friends with, he calls me on the phone and says, hey, remember that bank account you froze on Thursday? I'm like, yeah. He said, well, $864,000 just hit it. Ooh, <laughs> really? I said, where did it come from? It came from the McKinney Independent School District, which is just outside of my city. They had just got hit with a business email compromise and just lost $865,000. Well, guess what? That money wasn't going anywhere because I had it frozen. And we got them their money back within about two weeks. They got their money back. Um, so get with your district attorney. Make sure your DA is good with you doing freeze letters. Um, they're very, very simple to do, and it does not take much. I'll even mail you that, highlighted in yellow, what you need to change. <clears throat> um, we've already talked about the SARS. Um, they are gold. Um, I, they are, there's so much information in there, but remember when we're talking about SARS, that is highly confidential and we can't really talk about it. Okay. But when you read the, the paperwork and the rules of what you need to follow, you'll understand it. Okay. And you'll know how to work around it. Oh, okay. <laughs> what to do. This is where we talk about thinking outside of the box. Uh, ask for help. Um, do not be afraid to ask someone for some help. Um, this is what I had to do. I've only been doing financial crime for about six years. And every year I get major multi-million dollar cases and I get more than one every year. I get several of them. Um, ask for help. Secret Service, FBI are wonderful people to work with. Um, it's just like anyone, you gotta find the right person. Okay, because um, sometimes some of my guys at the Secret Service are not so easy to deal with. Some of my other guys at the Secret Service are good to deal with. Some of my buddies at the Bureau are not so good to deal with. Some of my guys at the Bureau are wonderful to deal with. Um, so it's just finding that right connection to that right person. Um, but take advantage of your federal partners. They're here to help. Um, do surveillance. If you are identifying a suspect in your area, do surveillance on them. Be prepared for counter surveillance. I cannot tell you how many times we ran into counter surveillance, um, and it happens. This is where if you have your federal partners on board, especially the Secret Service, this is one of their expertise, and the Bureau is great at it also. They, will, they know what to key up on, on counter surveillance. Um, we had counter surveillance on several of our, our cases. Like, whoa, whoa, whoa how, how come this guy's now watching? Um, hard surveillance, that's you putting your eyes out there doing hard surveillance on it. Poll cams, um, we have poll cams. My department owns poll cams, and we put up poll cams. Um, they, you'd be surprised what you can learn from putting up your poll cams. Um, take photos, take videos. Um, we worked a group of Chinese um, that laundered $26 million dollars Every one of the victims was elderly. Twenty-six million in eighteen months through gift cards. We actually started having a lot of fun with this. Um, it kind of got to where um, it was now a game, and I cannot t I cannot tell you how many selfies I have with my suspect. Yes, I took selfies with my suspect. I had dinner with my suspect. Um, we sat right next to him eating dinner. We were, okay, how close can we get? How close can we get? Um, so you, the job does have to be fun, but just don't make it too much fun. Um, 
actually have a, we actually went to trial on one of ours and <clears throat> while I'm interviewing her, um, I asked her, I said, that Ferris wheel didn't scare you, did it? And she looked at me like, what are you talking about? Um, she had gone to um, the Colony, Texas, and there's a giant Ferris wheel at the Nebraska Furniture Mart. And she rode the Ferris wheel, and I rode the Ferris wheel with her. I had dinner right next to her. Um, but you want to know about somebody? Do a trash run. Do a trash pull. It is the most disgusting thing in the entire world, but you will learn about people. <clears throat> um, those are just some of the ones that you can focus on. Here's some of our success stories because I know I'm going over my time. Um, we worked at West African romance fraud, grandpa scams, Indian uh, scams out of India, Chinese money, uh, gift card scams, crypto scams. Um, my most recent one was Cuban uh, card cloning. Um, here's some photos that we've taken. This one right here is seven, almost 7,000 cloned gift cards. And we just did this one just a couple of months ago. Um, it was a fun case. We did a lot of surveillance on it. Remember I talked about the FedEx packages? There you go. Um, you have an envelope, FedEx envelope, and you start feeling it. It's a magazine, and then you feel something that is about this size in the center of the magazine. What is that? U.S. currency. Okay. Did you know that FedEx and UPS can open up that envelope without a search warrant? Yes, they can because they are in care custody control of that item. So all I had to do is I laid a $20 bill. I'm surprised I had $20 in my pocket. My wife didn't know I had it. Um, I laid that down right there on it where it was the exact same size as the U.S. currency. And the lady said, that's got to be money. She opened it up, $10,000 in cash sitting right there. And she said, well, that explains a lot. And I'm like, why? Six more packages going to the same address. Every one of them had cash in it. And I didn't know about those. I just knew about that one. <clears throat> do, do, do. Okay, here we go. Um, on that particular case, 79 fake IDs my suspect had in his car. And we started looking through his FedEx packages, and the FedEx packages had the same names on there, he would use a fake ID to pick up the FedEx packages that contained cash inside of them. <clears throat> um, $200,000 we seized on that one, um, $80,000 on a grandpa scam. Um, very proud to say that these two trucks right here actually sold yesterday in auction, and the entire proceeds go right back to the victims. Um, we seized them. It took us about a year and a half to finally get them to auction. Um, we auctioned those off, and the, every bit of that money goes right back to victim compensation. Um, this was the uh, $26 million money laundering case through uh, gift cards. I know every one of you law enforcement are having that scam right now where your victims are told to go buy gift cards. Um, those are the gift cards that we seized. That's $681,000 in gift cards that we seized. Um, some of our successes, uh, most recent one was a romance fraud, and this is a state case, okay? Um, this case, we split it. We ended up, this subject was doing romance fraud. He was also doing business email compromise and COVID relief fraud, okay? So we took the case. The state of Texas is going to take this half of it, and the U.S. is going to take this half. And just on the state of Texas, he was sentenced to 20 years in prison, and we hadn't even gone federal yet. Um, but there's some of the ones that we've had a lot of success in. Um, it's been a lot of fun. Um, I would highly recommend that you guys reach out to people. Um, I will brought plenty of business cards. I'll be happy to give you my card. Um, my contact information is right here. Um, you are more than welcome to call me, email me, send me a text message. Um, I will respond. Make sure you put who you are. Because um, sometimes if I don't recognize your number, I may not pick it up because I think you're probably trying to sell me something um, or you're trying to scam me. Um, yeah, yeah, we are probably IT technical support, um, but feel free to reach out to me. Um, like I said, I started this job 23 years ago and majority of my career has been narcotics or drug interdiction. And now I'm into fraud and I will tell you I'm having more fun working financial fraud than I ever did with narcotics. Um, it has been so much fun. 
um, and so rewarding to know that you can put a bad guy in jail for what they're doing to our elderly people because if you guys don't go out there and protect them, no one's going to. It has to be us. Great. Thanks, Jeff. So I'm largely going to skip my presentation because so much of what I was going to talk about has either been said or I think there's a lot of expertise in the room, Jeff and Rachel. Um, and you know, we'd love to answer questions that folks have. I guess the only thing that I would add um, that hasn't really been talked about yet is the money mule issue. I'm guessing that virtually all of you have had contact with money mule in the past, right? Sitting shaking heads. Um, a lot of what can be done at the state level actually can't be done as well at the federal level. Money, the money mule problem is prolific. There are tens of thousands of money mules across the country. That is probably the uh, way that the vast majority of uh, elder fraud schemes get their money because the operators are abroad. They need somebody in the U.S. to receive their money. And so uh, I've seen a lot of great examples of what can be done at a state and local level to prosecute money mules uh, using uh, state statutes. Um, and again, that can be done more effectively than we can. So I would encourage that wherever you can. A lot of our federal cases are based on working up uh, from state level prosecutions of money mules, then to herders or other organizers of money mule networks, and then ultimately abroad. Uh, but where you don't have the resources to address money mules via prosecution, we would encourage you to, to proceed in any way you can, even through warning letters. We have our money mule initiative that we engage in with FBI, Secret Service, Postal Inspection Service, and other federal law enforcement agencies. But we would very much encourage you all to use money mule warning letters to notify anybody you're not going to proceed and investigate. If they're out there, if they are receiving money from victims, warn them. And if possible, notify a federal law enforcement counterpart that you have warned this person so they can potentially be put into a database uh, so that we can then be notified. 80 to 90% of, of money mules who are warned stop. And when we have tens of thousands of money mules across the country, some of them knowing conspirators, some of them elderly victims who are convinced to become money mules, we have to address this problem. We cannot prosecute our way out of it. If you want to prosecute them, great. But if you can't, then warn them. Most of them will stop. And if they don't stop, if we know that they've continued because we have your warning letter or a warning letter from a federal partner, that makes it so easy to prosecute them because we have the mens rea, we have the knowledge evidence we need to prosecute them. So I would just encourage you what we've seen in multiple different circumstances, again, 80 to 90% of the people warned stop because they don't want to get caught, they don't want to get in trouble. And a lot of times they're victims. First of all, you have to convince them that you're actually law enforcement because most of them won't believe you at the outset. But once you've convinced them that you're actually law enforcement, then warn them and, they, and chances are they will stop. So again, would love to hear questions from folks. Uh, for Jeff, for Rachel, happy to answer any questions I can, but open up the floor. Got a, a question back here. I think the mic is going back. Up, oh, sorry. Hi. So this is going back a few presentations ago, but um, I was just wondering that when you see an uptick um, in reports, how do you decipher if there's an uptick in crime versus an uptick in reporting? Um, Rachel, do you want to take that? Um, that's actually a good question. It's really hard to tell whether it's just education and more people know to report or is there more fraud that's happening um you really get out, you really don't know um one way we kind of look at it is if you know the date the timeline within the complaints the reports that we get um scams are always going to change they are always going to evolve so but it's generally the same people doing it um like i said you don't know and what we hope by education is just getting it out there and the more reports we get 
that we can better focus our efforts, you know, in one direction or another, depending on what gets reported to us. Um, three years ago, you would never have heard of pig butchering. So that, yeah, that's, that's probably the newest thing that's come out, you know, um, but it's all on reports and we don't know what to do if it's, we're not told about it. And there are corroborating features, right? If you're seeing a spike in romance fraud, you should also see an increase in suspicious activity reports during the same period of time, right? There are other ways that we may see increases in gift card purchases. So we try to corroborate across a number of different sources to see, is there really an increase in the actual amounts of crime? I don't think the IC3, FTC, they do a great job in getting the word out on their reporting resources, but there isn't any sort of reason to believe that all of a sudden people are gonna start rushing to IC3 or FTC versus what they were doing a month ago. But we see every one of the spikes that we see here is corroborated by other indications that yes, this kind of crime, you know, crypto investment scams or whatever are on the increase. Question that one right there. I have one. Um, with the um, the couriers, I think probably everyone can't hear me. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, people online. Sorry about that. Um, with the with the uh, cash couriers, are you seeing that as an international scam? going through a rideshare program because i've just started seeing this with my large sums of money and it's not it's i've had the grandparent scam and i've also had the the jury duty scam the warrant scam but i'm trying to connect the dots at how they're contacting these couriers i'm guessing that the rideshare couriers and they're messaging them and then build a relationship with them so some of them are couriers that are just ride shares and that's what they do. They take things from one place to another and they, some of them don't even know it's an illegal thing. So I don't want to say it's all of them, you know? So right. There are rings that specifically do this and they are contracted by the people perpetrating the scams in Africa, India, wherever to do just this. Um, and that's their business. You hire them to do this, but I would not say all ride shares are doing this. Some of them are just, picking up from one thing and taking it somewhere else. Right, and in any of the cases that I've had and my and my uh, partners have had, um, none of them have been the same vehicle, um, but it's always been a small compact with, you know, an adult male that is dressed. Um, so I'm trying to, I'm trying to, trying to figure out whether we have a local sale or if, this is a, and so I haven't reached out to Uber or Lyft to see if we can run these addresses, you know, for, for services, but I, that may be my next move. Yeah, I definitely would do that. And, um, but I forgot where I was going to go with this. For some of these scams, um, the, the, the carrier, the courier actually goes from city to city to do this. They will do it in one area for a while and then, or they will fly three hours south to rent a car and go pick up from somebody else. They're here just for that purpose. Um, we see that a lot with like with the Indian call center stuff is that they will have somebody come in country on a, you know, here for legit purposes, maybe school or whatever, and they are doing this on the side and that's how they get the school paid for. Okay. And this is actually an evolution of scam of the grandparent scam based on the work that you all are doing and that we're doing in coordination together. So, as was said, a lot of these grandparent scams, the, the newest innovation two years ago was that they would have local couriers that would visit all over and they would claim to be a bail bondsman, right? They would show up in the door and say, hey, I'm the bail bondsman here to collect the bail for your grandchild, and then they would go to the next part, the next place. But you all arrested enough of those people that you kind of put them out of business. And then we prosecuted a bunch of them for a racketeering 
in the U.S., and we've got other cases that we're bringing against those couriers based on state investigations and prosecutions where they stopped using the same people and instead now they're using Uber and Lyft drivers. So they may or may not know that they're facilitating a fraud, but it's harder for them to commit the scam if they're not claiming to be a bail bondman. Some Uber driver just shows up to their house asking some money. It's not as convincing to the victim. So this is how working together, I think, helps. But we're still going to see this new, these new kind of innovations when they can't use the same process. The other thing that we're seeing real briefly are foreign nationals renting Airbnb rooms to receive FedEx and UPS shipments. And then they'll move to a different Airbnb, pick up there. They may be on a student visa um, or some other kind of visa to get into the country. And all they do is pop from Airbnb to Airbnb where they get their packages and their instruction of where to go next to pick up their next group of package. So again, it, it's a, these are major networks that are being created, but it's because of the great work that's being done by that's you all. One thing I wanted to say is that, you know, a lot of these couriers when are getting picked up by locals and the information that they can provide to FBI, DHS, all of that, that feeds up into our bigger cases to go through the people who are actually running the scams. So to tag along with that, what I would recommend that you do. Yeah, Rachel, just to add something to the comment uh, conversation about Uber. So we have an agent in our Boston office who has a really strong relationship with Uber and they will call that agent and say, hey, reach out to LAPD, reach out to this jurisdiction. There is a scam in progress. We strongly encourage state and local law enforcement to establish a relationship with Uber and they will pick up the phone and call you um, and direct you where to go. Highly recommend it. I didn't want to out him. 